Hi everyone and welcome to another review. Today we're looking at a stunning colouring book that I got from Etsy. A friend showed me the listing and I just had a quick look at the images inside and knew that I had to get this to review because it is amazing. It's a gorgeous book. The artwork is incredible. So um, it's about Greek gods and goddesses and it's the... Um, title translates roughly to the nature of the gods but it's it's greek mythology that we're looking at here and this is the artist edition that's available on etsy there are also um amazon printed ones available but obviously you know the quality of amazon paper so it's up to you whether you want to get that one or this artist edition that is spiral bound and it's on really nice heavyweight paper so here's the cover and the back so you can see some of the illustrations inside and what they look like when they're coloured and yeah the artwork's just amazing it's definitely one of my favourite books that I've found uh, this year like I said a friend showed it to me and I knew I just had to get it so let's have a look inside here is the title page which you can colour and it matches the, the front cover of the page so you can copy those colours if you want to totally up to you and then we have the contents. Now, this is really handy because it shows us exactly which Greek god or goddess or entity um, the illustration is portraying. So we've got two contents pages you can see here. And what I've done is I've done a couple of hours worth of research just to make this a more interesting review so that we know exactly who each of these people are and a bit about them, a bit about their stories. And it's been really interesting to learn about more uh, Greek mythology and all these characters and, and what happened to them so this is not going to be a, a fast flip through if you're looking for that then this is not the video for you or you might just want to skip um, ahead and have a look at the images but we are going to be talking in depth about the um, the subject of the images so this first image is called the void and according to the ancient Greeks the void or chaos as it's otherwise known was the primordial void that existed before creation. It was a shapeless and formless state of being characterised by a complete lack of order and structure. So essentially, it was the ultimate expression of disorder and confusion. Stephen Fry, in his book Mythos, a retelling of Greek mythology, writes that whatever the truth, science today agrees that everything is destined to return to chaos. It calls this the inevitable fate of entropy, part of the great cycle from chaos to order and back again to chaos. Now, chaos isn't actually a god or a goddess, but is often considered to be the mother of all creation. It was chaos who gave birth to the gods, the titans and everything else in the universe. Chaos is sometimes portrayed as a feminine force with the potential for life and creation residing within her formless void. And this illustration is clearly symbolic of that. So you can see that there is a lot of grayscale on this one. Most of the images inside aren't as dark as this, but the first few are. Um, and I guess because this is chaos and the void, there needs to be a lot of darkness around um, the image. But it's it's just absolutely incredible. The, none of this is AI. This is all hand-drawn art. And yeah, I'm just, I'm in love with it. So next we have Gaia or Gaia, who is considered to be one of the most powerful beings in Greek mythology, as she was one of the first primordial deities of the universe. She's not a god, but she gave birth to the gods of sea and sky. She's the mother of all life. Some of her powers include control over the lands and weather, along with producing many strong children with or without a spouse. And her children are known as the Titans. So again, absolutely gorgeous illustration. Um, you can just, I, I really want to use water media on the next page that I colour for this. I've used pencil on the one I'll show you in a bit, but I just feel like it would look like an old ancient watercolour fresco. You know, it's it's got that kind of beauty to it. Next up is Nukta or Nyx, and this is the goddess of the night. She's often depicted as winged. And she can impact mankind in a good or a bad way using her ability to bring sleep or death onto the human race. This is not a goddess to mess about with. Even Zeus feared Nyx because she was older and stronger than him. Now, Nyx married Erebus, the god of darkness, and they produced Hemera, who is day, and Aether, who is light. 
Other versions of the Greek myth depict Nyx and Hemera as sisters, though, rather than mother and daughter. And that is a common thread throughout Greek mythology. You've got sisters and daughters and mothers and fathers whose children are their brothers. And it's all <laughs> it's all very uh, a tangled web. So this is Hemera. She's the goddess of the day and she was very close with her mother slash sister Nyx. They moved in counterpart to one another. So Nyx was the night and she retreated from the sky as Hemera as the day appeared. So they were never, never the twain shall meet. They were always on the way out as the other one came in. This is Irida or Iris, and she is the personification of the rainbow and a messenger of the gods. Iris appears in several stories carrying messages to and from the gods or running errands, but she's not really got any unique mythology of her own. And in ancient art, she's depicted as a winged young woman carrying a caducus. I'm not sure how you say it, uh, but it's the staff. So if you look here, this is a very common symbol. And this is the staff that is called the cad caduceus or whatever, however you say it. It's a symbol of the messengers and also a pitcher of water for the gods. So we've got all of this symbology here. Um, you know, of, of th this illustrator has really done her homework on the Greek myths. And there are little bits, especially in the corners of these pillars that um, pertain to that particular god or goddess. So here we have a bit more of a common and well-known couple. This is Hades and Persephone. Hades was the god of the underworld and he kidnapped Persephone, the goddess of nature, after falling in love with her. She then ate four seeds of a pomegranate, which you can see she's holding in her hand. And that meant that she must spend four months of the year in the underworld with Hades. So he allowed her to spend the other eight months on the earth before bringing her back to the underworld for winter. Persephone was very unhappy, as you can imagine, in the underworld. But after a long, long time, it did come to love Hades and lived happily with him. It's worth noting that a lot of there are a lot of interpretations of Greek myth and some of them um, differ from each other so I'm just reading the research that I've that I've accrued online but there are different ones Homer says something different to someone else and it's it's really complicated so this is Hera and Hera is the wife and sister of Zeus and the goddess of marriage and childbirth she's a jealous figure who was vengeful towards Zeus's many lovers and illegitimate children who you will see a lot of in the book and she was often seen as very angry and a vindictive character but the peacock was sacred to her. So that's why the peacock's been included here um, on the illustration. And, you know, just going back to the artwork, isn't it just gorgeous? The shading, I, I particularly love these illustrations that aren't so dark, but there's still a lot of guidance shading in there for you to colour the, uh, the folds of the material or the shadows of the skin. And yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Next up, we have the Siren and Jason. So Jason was a hero and leader of the Argonauts who hunted for the Golden Fleece in Greek mythology. On the return journey, Chiron had told Jason that without the aid of Orpheus, the Argonauts would never be able to pass the Sirens. These Sirens lived on three small rocky islands and sang beautiful songs that enticed sailors to come to them, which resulted in the crashing of their ship to the islands. When Orpheus heard their voices, he then played music that was more beautiful and louder, which drowned out the sirens' bewitching songs, and Jason was able to get home. So here's the one that I've coloured. I'm just going to move it out of the way, the glare, because sometimes that you can't see it properly. So Poseidon was the brother of Zeus and Hades, and he was the god of the sea. Uh, also earthquakes, storms and horses. He's considered one of the most bad-tempered, moody and greedy Olympian gods. And he was known to be quite vengeful when insulted. But he was portrayed as a strong, mature man with a dark beard wielding a tri trident. So as you can see, this is the one that I've coloured. I used a mixture of Derwent Lightfast, Prismacolor and Caran d'Ache Luminance pencils for this. And I just really enjoyed colouring it. And I love how the final product has turned out. Um, you know, the glowing of the trident. And I, obviously I had to use a lot of blue on this with him being a water god. But um, yeah, I just really, really enjoyed colouring it. And hopefully with this, you can see just how amazing a finished product can look um, from this book. Because you've got you've got the foundation of the, the amazing artwork. And then with colour on top, it just becomes something totally different. 
So next we have Chloris. So Chloris was a nymph who was abducted by Zephyrus, the god of the west wind. He then transformed her into a goddess known as Flora after they were married. And she was thereafter named the goddess of the flowers, which is why she's full of flowers and nature. And um, yeah, there's a lot of abductions and incestual things and things going off in Greek mythology. It's, um, it's definitely one for Jerry Springer, let's say. So next up, we've got a fawn. And the fawn are actually more of a Roman myth than Greek, although the two do overlap quite a lot in history. The satyr is a similar creature that's more known in Greek myth. And whilst they're very similar in origin, they apparently have a lot of difference in looks. So this illustration particularly could allude to Pan, which is the god of nature and the woodlands. The bottom half of his body is like a goat and the top half is a human man. However, he is often depicted with horns on his head, which you can see has been depicted in this artwork. And he's often illustrated with his pan flute. So, yes, we have the fawn. You can see there are some pan pipes here and um, the, the ram for the horns. So, yes, very, very interesting. I hope you find this as interesting as I do. Um, in one story, Pan actually helps his friend survive a vicious struggle by letting out an immense cry that frightened the enemy and caused him to run away. And from that story, we get the word panic. So Pan, panic, that's where that word has come from. Very interesting. It is to me anyway. So this is Artemis and Artemis was an illegitimate daughter of Zeus and was known as the goddess of the hunt. Her mother was a titan named Leto and she was forbade to give birth to Artemis and her twin Apollo on any land by an enraged Hera, Zeus's wife at the time. Um, luckily, Leto found a floating island that Poseidon ripped up from the seafloor and she was then able to give birth to Artemis and Apollo. So Artemis was a known virgin who protected her chastity at all costs. For this reason, she captured the attention of gods and men across the land. And it wasn't until Orion came along that she fell in love. Unfortunately, Orion, another hunting god, longed to kill every animal on earth. And Gaia, the goddess of the earth, sent a giant scorpion to kill him. Upon his death, Artemis sent him to the stars and created the Orion constellation. It's a bit of a sad story. Now, this, of course, is very recognisable. This is Medusa. And she was actually a beautiful maiden with golden hair and vowed to be celibate her entire life as a priestess of Athena until she fell in love with Poseidon. So she went against her vow and married him, and for this, Athena punished her hideously by turning Medusa into an ugly creature, making her eyes bloodshot and raging, and her face really hag-like. And her once lovely golden hair was then morphed into poisonous snakes. Her pure white milky skin turned a sickly green hue, and from then on, she roamed, shamed and shunned and loathed by everyone, with her curse that caused anyone she looked upon to turn to stone. So another really sad story. Um, and there is a lot of uh, women and goddesses being celibate in these stories um, and, and their virginal quality, which I think is a little bit misogynistic, but it's Greek myth for you. Now, this is Dionysus, and he's also known as Bacchus. I believe in America, that, or maybe even in the Deep South or um, in... Um, were New Orleans. I think they have a Bacchus festival. Um, and he was one of the 12 Olympians and was the ancient Greek god of wine and grape harvest. He was another illegitimate son of Zeus and Semele, the princess of Thebes. Now, a jealous hero this time tricked Semele into dem demanding that Zeus reveal his true form to her. And as a mortal, Semele could not look upon a god's true form without dying. So Zeus managed to just about rescue the unborn Dionysus get this, by sewing him into his thigh. <laughs> a few months later, Dionysus was born from Zeus's thigh. You make it make sense. He was then taken to Silenus and the rain nymphs of Mount Nysa were, raised, um, were raising him, hidden away from Hera's wrath. He learned to cultivate grapes and became the first to turn them into wine. So there's Hera's jealousy again, um, not so much taken out on Zeus, but more taken out on his um, partners and their children. And you'll see that a lot. So here's Athena and she was the goddess of war. She was born from Zeus after he experienced an enormous headache and she sprang fully grown and in armour from his forehead. <laughs> Honestly, you can't, I'm, I'm just, well, it's jaw dropping really when you read about these things. If you don't know about them already, you just, it's incredible. 
So as soon as she was born, she won Zeus's heart and became his favourite child. However, because she never received a mother's care, she inevitably possessed more masculine than feminine attributes. So yes, the goddess of war. And uh, you can see that there are a few different things, like I said, implanted into the illustration that have uh, meaning towards those characters. So if you do more research, you will find out sort of what these symbols mean. Then we have Aphrodite, who is the goddess of love and beauty. She supposedly arose from the sea when the titan Cronus killed his father Uranus and threw his genitals into the sea. <laughs> so killed his father, threw his genitals in the sea and then Aphrodite arose from the foam. Another, another story um, said that she was yet another illiterate child of um, Zeus, which I can actually believe with his track record. But, you know, many gods believed that um, Aphrodite's beauty was such that their rivalry over her would spark a war of the gods. Because of this, Zeus married Aphrodite to Hephaestus. I hope I'm saying that right. Hephaest Hephaestus. I think it's Hephaestus. I think Hephaestus is a different one. I don't know. Anyway. Um, he wasn't seen as a threat because he was apparently very ugly and deformed. So Zeus married her off so that it wouldn't cause a big um, war of the men. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, but despite this marriage to Hephaestus, Aphrodite had many lovers, including both gods and men, and conceived many children, including Eros, otherwise known as Cupid, who we all know from Valentine's. So this is Apollo and Daphne. Mentioned earlier, Apollo was the twin brother of Artemis and the son of Zeus. He was the god of light, so it was his job to pull the sun across the sky in his four-horse chariot every day. He was also the god of prophecies, medicine and plague, so he could heal people as well as cause disease by shooting them with his arrows. So you can see he's got his bow and arrow here. And she's just not very happy at all, is she? <laughs> Um, this is Daphne and she was a nymph and a daughter of a river god. She was famous for being incredibly beautiful and catching the eye of Apollo. However, Daphne was determined to remain unmarried and untouched by a man for the rest of her life. Greek mythology states that Apollo had been mocking Cupid, who in retaliation fired two arrows, a gold arrow that struck Apollo and made him fall in love with Daphne and a lead arrow that made Daphne hate Apollo. Under the spell of the arrow, Apollo continued to follow Daphne, but she continued to reject him. And it's believed that Daphne had to sacrifice her body and turn into a tree, as this was the only way she could avoid Apollo's sexual advances. <laughs> so you can see her here. She's not looking happy. She's turning herself slowly into a tree um, just to get away from Apollo. The things you do for love. Uh, these are the three Mori. Hopefully that's how you say it. And they're often referred to as the fates. The Mori are a group of goddesses who watch over everyday life. They collect the threads of each life, making sure that it follows fate's plans and then cut the threads to end a life. The Mori are destiny incarnate and they are some of the only forces who hold power over both gods and mortals. So Clotho spins the threads of life. Lachesis measures out each life and Atropos kind of creepy looking one back here, was responsible for cutting the threads and ending the life. Now, this is Hestia, who was the goddess of the hearth, home and family. Although both Poseidon and Apollo wanted to marry her, Hestia made an oath to Zeus that she would remain forever pure and undefiled, never entering into union with a man. Again, there's a lot of sex shaming and misogyny in Greek myth. Uh, so, yeah, this is Hestia. Now, here's the main man himself, Lothario and womanizer Zeus. <laughs> he was a sky god who controlled lightning and thunder. Zeus is the king of Mount Olympus, where all the gods lived. Um, and he was regarded as wise, fair, just, merciful and prudent. But he was also unpredictable. Nobody was able to guess the decisions he would make. He was also easily angered, which could be very destructive. He previously hurled lightning bolts and caused violent storms that wreaked havoc on Earth whenever he got a bit mad. Um, Zeus fell in love easily, as we know, and had many affairs with various women. However, he would severely punish anybody who attempted to escort or fall in love with his wife, Hera. So, uh, double standards. <laughs> um, the giant Porphyrian, hopefully that's how you say it, or Porphyrian, uh, 
he took a lightning bolt from Zeus after lusting after Hera. So, you know, go after Hera at your peril, but he can do whatever he wants. This is he Hecate, I think, Hecate. And Hecate was the goddess of witchcraft, magic and the moon and was often displayed holding two torches or a key. Well, you've got all of it there. Later periods show statues of Hecate in threefold, having three separate bodies and faces. It's unclear why this change took place, but some speculate that it represents the full moon, half moon and new moon. But again, there are so many interpretations with Greek myth. Here's Hermes, and he was the god of trade, thieves, travellers, sports, athletes and border crossings to the underworld. He's the illegitimate child of, you guessed it, Zeus. <laughs> he was conceived and born in the same day. So Hermes' son was Pan, who was the half man, half goat creature, the fawn from earlier. And um, Hermes primarily served as the herald or messenger of the gods shown by this staff that he holds, the same as the one from Iris before. He was considered a trickster due to his cunning and clever personality. And some of his symbols include a leather pouch, uh, winged sandals, as you can see here, and a rooster. So there's the pouch, the sandals, the rooster and the message that he was delivering. Here is Ares and he's the god of war and shockingly a child of Zeus and his wife, Hera. <laughs> so he's a, he's a legitimate child. Um, he was one of Aphrodite's lovers. If you remember, she was forced to marry the carpentry god Hephaestus so that her beauty didn't de drive all the men of Olympus insane. Um, one famous story sees Ares and Aphrodite trapped by Hephaestus while naked in bed using a clever device he made. So <laughs> Hephaestus came home and found uh, Ares and Aphrodite uh, in flagrante delicto, is that how they say it? And uh, he devised this, this trap for them, so they were trapped naked together. Um, Ares was most often characterised as a coward in spite of his connection to war. He responded to even the slightest injury with outrage, a bit like footballers nowadays. Uh, then we have Pythia, and this was the name of the high priestess of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. So she's a little bit further down um, in the uh, timeline, I guess, from Apollo. She specifically served as Delphi's oracle. And there's quite confusing information about her online. But I think basically she made prophecies about the world whilst being possessed by the spirit of the god Apollo, who earlier we found was um, a prophesizer himself. So she's sort of the channel by which these prophecies would come to light. And here is Hephaestus, who was the husband, forced husband of Aphrodite. He was a god of carpentry, metalwork and fire and another suit, another son of Zeus and Hera. So legitimate child. Um, he was a smithing god, making all of the weapons for Olympus and acting like a blacksmith for the gods. So as we know, he was married off to Aphrodite because uh, none of the other men would be threatened enough by him to create a war for her affections. And um, he also crafted Cupid's arrows and Athena's sword, as well as the armour that Achilles wore in the Trojan War. So according to myth, he actually lusted after Athena, who spurned him and had to fight him off. Now, the rest of the story is quite graphic. So without going into detail, um, his deposit landed on the earth, which immediately birthed a son who was called Erichthonius. Again, don't know if I'm saying this right. And he was half child, half serpent. So just it's just so funny to learn about and it's so interesting. Um, I hope you found it interesting too. That's the end of the book. So let's just talk about the actual quality of the book itself, the production, etc. As you can see, it's spiral bound, um, which is great for it being able to lay flat. But um, one of the cons to this is that it's quite difficult to get into the area between the springs. Um, obviously, I've tried my best to do that, but you might be better off just um, sort of drawing a line down there and only colouring to that line. But it's annoying because the illustration does carry on into the binding. Um, it is not perforated. So when you take this out of the book, if you decide to do, you will have all of these these bits um, of squares and rips on the end. So you probably have to end up chopping that off anyway, if you're you know, framing it or giving it away to somebody, whatever. Um, the paper, really, really thick. I believe it's 300 GSM. Um, I could be wrong, actually. Um, 
if I'm wrong, I'll put it on the screen now, uh, but it's very thick. It does have a slight tooth to it, but it feels more smooth than toothy. But there is definitely a bit of a tooth there. It just, I would describe it as more on the smooth side. When I was colouring, I found that the luminance and the light fast worked incredibly well. Sometimes the Prismacolor wouldn't quite lay down properly and you ended up getting um, speckles. I don't know whether you can see in this area here. But um, yeah, obviously you can see it, 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 they've all blended well. So it's a good paper for pencils, obviously markers as well with it being one sided and wet media. So yeah, best of all worlds, really. I just can't help thinking that this guy looks just like Mel Gibson. I mean, is it just me or has he got Mel Gibson's face? Maybe it's just me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there you go. It's it's white paper. It is lovely um, and shaded, so you don't have to think about highlights and shadows and stuff. And what can I say other than I absolutely love this book. The artwork is top notch. And uh, I really recommend that you get it if you're at all interested in the subject matter or indeed the illustrations. Um, so I'll leave the links in the description for the artist edition, which I have here available on Etsy or the Amazon printed edition which is obviously quicker and cheaper for you to get hold of but doesn't have the paper quality or the production quality of this so leave it in your hands I would absolutely love to know what you think of this book and I hope you've enjoyed this review with a bit of information um, hopefully I haven't blathered on for too long um, you might want to slow the video down because I realise when I get on a roll especially when I'm reading off of notes that um, I can speak really quickly. And I actually had a comment the other day from somebody telling me to slow down. Um, so <laughs> obviously that's not, I've not taken that into uh, on board. So um, if you want to slow it down, I think you can slow it down. But uh, yeah, anyway, I'm waffling now. So I will let you go on with your day and I hope you've enjoyed watching this. Do let me know in the comments and I'll see you soon on Colour With Claire.